Um, I want to finish the data part on classical thermodynamics by going into uh, some details of the clausius clapeyron relation. Um, so, um, what the Clapeyron equation uh, gives you is a differential equation for a phase boundary. And that's mostly what we'll develop today. First, um, the, uh, the typical form of the Clapeyron equation, and then later I'll do the generalized form. So if you have a phase boundary between two phases, alpha and beta, um, the Clapeyron equation will describe, give you an equation for that boundary. And the way that's done is that if you define delta G or any delta operation here as the difference between the two phases across the boundary, like say alpha minus beta in this case, uh, then we know that all, at the boundary delta G is zero. So at the boundary, the, the differential of delta G has to be zero as well. Right, so the free energies of alpha and beta are the same at the boundary. So along the boundary, this differential is zero. And that's going to give us a constraint on uh, the temperature and pressure variation, which will be the equation for the boundary. So if I write this out, that means that along the boundary, minus S alpha dt alpha, uh, plus V alpha DP alpha, sorry, there should be no alpha here, um, is minus S beta DT plus V beta DP. Because of course, this here, this is DG alpha, and this here is DG beta. And there goes my pen again. So I can group now the entropy terms and the volume terms. So I get my differential equation along the boundary that along the boundary, dp and dt are related uh, by as delta s over delta v, where the delta, so let's evaluate for a second what everything is, right? The delta indicates the property difference between the two phases. So delta S is S beta minus S alpha, delta V is V beta minus V alpha. And this is the differential equation um, for the um, boundary. In general, this is a nonlinear differential equation because delta S and delta V themselves depend on T and P, right? That dependence is not explicitly written here, but they do. Um, you can write this in a different form because along the boundary, delta H is T delta S. So you can also write the Clapeyron in the form dP dT is delta H divided by T delta V. And sometimes this is a, a, a more easy form to use because uh, heat of uh, transformations and volume of transformations are sort of uh, easier to to find uh, in experimental data. So let's look a little bit at what this typical slope is of pressures, pressure versus temperature. Um, for example, if you do a liquid to solid transition, Uh, or I should have said solid to liquid, and delta S, if I define it now as the, the property of the liquid minus the property of the solid, uh, this is always positive, right? The, end, the liquid has a higher entropy because I put in heat uh, to get there. Uh, what about delta V? So volume of the liquid minus volume of the solid. Well, as you know, that is actually in most cases that is positive. Usually liquids have a higher volume. So most of the time, uh, in which case dp dt would be positive. But of course, as we know, there are some exceptions and, and 
and they don't always look like exceptions because water is an exception and that's sort of the most common one component system that we deal with. So in some cases, this is negative. So water is a case where the solid has a higher volume than the liquid. Uh, there's some other solids like that. They're typically uh, uh, solids that are not particularly well packed in their, uh, um, in their solid state. So things like silicon germanium because they're uh, uh, close packed diamond, uh, bismuth. So these things uh, have DP, DT negative. So what that means is that the phase diagram that we sort of normally draw for water that looks like this, right? Solid liquid vapor. So this is for H2O. Uh, is a bit unusual because for most materials, the one component phase diagram looks more like this. Solid liquid vapor, right? So the line, the solid liquid line leans the other way uh, in this case. Okay, so you can see that this gives some unusual properties to water, like water, if you push on it, it melts, right? If you push on ice, it, you can make it melt. So, because if you put yourself in the solid here, in the solid state here, let's say you're at this temperature, and let's say this would be one atmosphere, then if you raise the pressure on it, you can bring it into the liquid regime. And there's an enormous debate going on whether that's why, whether, whether that's the reason um, why you can skate on ice or not, right? There's um, a lot of arguments whether, you know, it's a bit surprising you can skate on ice. Ice has actually very high coefficient of friction, um, but the theory is that the weight of the, the person who skates pushes on the blade, the blade has very, um, very small area, so that's enough pressure to melt the ice. Um, not everybody agrees with that, so I'm gonna sort of uh, leave it out there about what's actually true or not. Um, I wanna look a bit at typical uh, sizes of slope. So magnitude of the slope so we can do that because we have a sense of what um, the typical volumes across phase transitions and typical enthalpies are right so um, if I go from a solid to a liquid uh, remember what I showed you uh, several lectures ago, enthalpies are order sort of kilojoules per mole or maybe 10 kilojoules per mole order of magnitude. Um, what are typical delta Vs? They are both condensed phases. So typical delta Vs are gonna be of the order of CC per mole, right? Or less than that. So what that means for dp, dt, the slope, remember you're taking this, it's a fairly big number, right, in SI units, it's 10,000 joules per mole, and you're dividing it by something that's small in SI units, right? This is 10 to the minus six per mole. So that means that the slope is very large, and it can be positive or negative, right? Because this quantity can be positive or negative. Um, on the other hand, if you go from solid to gas, or from liquid to gas, the vapor phase, uh, delta H is of the order of hundreds of kilojoules per mole now. You remember from my examples. But now delta V is order, you know, 10 to the fourth cc per mole, right? The volume of a gas is, you know, at room temperature 20 ish uh, liters. So in this case, the slope is. Um, much smaller and can still be, um, but it's always positive. And that's true for both cases here. So, you know, in textbooks, we draw these diagrams the way I drew them on this board, just to make them clear, but they don't really look like that on a typical scale that we work. 
uh, on a typical scale that we work, the transition between solid and liquid is almost vertical. If you work on a small pressure scale, and then you kind of have the vapor lines here, right? So then you have the, the vapor or the gas here. Um, I want to give you an, an example of an actual calculation. So um, what's the pressure needed to raise the melting point uh, of lead by 10 degrees? And I'll give you some data for that and then I'll give you the answer so you can work it out at home. So the, the enthalpy of melting is about five kilojoules. It's exactly 4,810 joules per mole. The melting point is uh, 600 K at one atmosphere. The volume of the solid is 18.92 uh, centimeter cubed per mole. So cc's per mole. And the volume of the liquid is uh, 19.47 uh, centimeter cubed per mole. And these numbers are all at 600 K. So why don't you try to solve this? I mean, essentially you're just going to integrate the Clapeyron equation with some approximations. Um, you'll have to assume that uh, the enthalpy of melting and the volume differences don't depend on temperature and pressure since you have no, no information on that. But once you get the answer, you'll see that it's a pretty good approximation. You'll find that delta P uh, is 2,870 uh, atmospheres, so times 10 to the fifth pascals. So, so you need a very large pressure to change the melting point by 10 degrees. And again, this is the same argument we've always made, right? That um, where does this come from? This comes from the fact that the P delta V term modifies the Gibbs free energy, because let's look back at the Clapeyron equation. If I write the Clapeyron equation as dP dt is delta S over delta V, I can also rewrite it as delta V dP has to equal to delta S dt. And what you see here is that what the Clapeyron equation is requiring that the shift in free energy difference caused by pressure and temperature is the same, right? This is the free energy difference between the phases caused by the shift in temperature. And this is the free energy difference caused by the shift in temperature. And because this is sort of a much more powerful handle on phase equilibria than this one, because the delta V is small in SI units, you need very large pressures. So chemical forces, thermodynamic forces, are much larger than mechanical forces, which is why mechanics really only shows up in thermodynamics at very high uh, stresses of pressure, uh, stresses or pressure, something we've um, discussed in the past. So the Clapeyron equation can be simplified when you only consider equilibrium with the vapor phase. So when the phase boundary look at, you look at is from a condensed phase, so solid or liquid uh, to a vapor, because now you can make two approximations. So let me first restate the Clapeyron equation, but now with delta H 
divided by t put in for the entropy. Um, so if I use the vapor, I can make two approximations. The first one is that delta V, which is defined as V of the vapor minus V of the condensed phase, so in this case, solid or liquid, that, that this is essentially V of the vapor because you know that the molar volume of the vapor is at least a thousand times bigger than the volume of the condensed phase. So we will write that as the volume of the vapor. Um, and the second approximation is that the vapor behaves as an ideal gas. So that means that I can write the vapor volume in terms of RT divided by P. And that allows me to simplify the Clapeyron equation as delta H divided by T volume of the vapor, which I can now substitute in what that is. So I get P delta H over R T squared, which looks messy, but I'm gonna uh, rewrite that. So I can do separation of variables here, since this is a differential equation. So I bring all the P terms to one side. So I get dP over P here. Um, and that is equal to delta H divided by R dt over t squared. And dt over t squared is the differential of one over t, right? Or minus the differential of one over t. So this is equal to minus the differential of one over t. And that leads us to the final form of the Clapeyron equation or Clausius Clapeyron equation by now is that the differential of the log of p, right? Because dp over p is the differential of the log of p is minus delta h over r, the differential of one over t. And why is this equation simpler? I mean, okay, so stay down uh, because it maybe doesn't look simpler to you because I'm now relating I now have an equation for the phase boundary in terms of only one property difference, right? Before I had two, I had delta H and delta V or delta S and delta V. Now I just have delta H, so the latent heat in the transformation. And, and, uh, and this becomes important because the latent heat is sort of usually tabulated, it's easy to measure, it's easy to determine. So that means if we can measure the latent heat of transformation at one condition, so one pair of pressure and temperature, we have a really good way of extrapolating uh, this equilibrium into other domains. And we'll do that a few times. Professor? Yes. Uh, why do you represent the, um, it has like little d ln p? Because you, you're integrating, right? No, I'm not integrating. I'm actually um, rewriting the differential. So dp over p here, that is, so I'm not integrating yet, right? I'm right, that is actually the same as the differential of the logarithm of p. Oh, okay, I was reading it as like you integrated, then you had like ln p one, like two minus ln p one. No, of. not yet, right? So. I, this is still in differential equation form. If I integrate this, this will become log P, and I actually was about to do that on the other board. This will become log P is something one over T plus some constants, right? Okay. Thank you. Okay, so let's integrate this. 
uh, typically there are two versions of the integration done. Uh, one where delta H is assumed to be constant, in which case this integration is easy. But remember, right, when you do thermodynamics, um, you should always worry about when you have these quantities like delta H or delta V or delta S up front, uh, they are not necessarily constant, right? They are a function of temperature and pressure as well. So, so uh, unless you know that dependence, you can't integrate this. But of course, so we'll do the first case. So case one is when delta H uh, is not a function of T or P. And then this integration becomes easy, right? Then it's the logarithm of um, P is going to go like minus delta H over R times one over T plus some constant. Or what that means is that if I plot log P versus one over T, I'll get a straight line and, and the slope here is minus delta H over R. And actually um, we will later show, actually this lecture, that this P is actually also what's called the vapor pressure. It's not just the pressure of the equilibrium, but it's also the vapor pressure, which is a measurable quantity. And so uh, this is actually one way to measure uh, latent heat. It's not the most straightforward way, but you, you measure vapor pressure, you plot log vapor pressure versus one over T. Um, the case that's more common where you don't assume that delta H is uh, independent of temperature, but where you assume that there's a delta CP between the phases uh, that's different from zero, but not a function of temperature. And that means that delta H becomes linear in temperature. So when I have to integrate the Clapeyron equation now, um, so when you integrate Clapeyron now, you're going to get something that looks like the logarithm of P will go like some constant, I'll call it A times one over T. Uh, that's just like what I get here. That comes from the constant part of the enthalpy plus a term that looks like the logarithm of T plus a constant. And if you ever look up vapor pressures in books, you'll often find it in this form. It, it will be written in logarithmic form as a function of one over T plus log T. And so there's a reason it's written that way. What's also kind of cool is that if you actually get this equation, you could, you could actually work backward, right? And this equation embeds the enthalpy difference between the phases and its heat capacity difference, because that's how it's derived. I'm not going through the integration here. I would like you to do uh, that yourself. So the reason I spend so much time on this is um, I want to explain now because this isn't just about uh, one component vapor phase equilibria. It's because this is also an extremely good um, approximation to what's called the vapor pressure. So let me first explain and try to carefully define what the vapor pressure of a substance is. So the vapor pressure is defined as it's the partial pressure that um, that the substance in a condensed phase
establishes in the vapor above it. I should say in the vapor phase in contact with it. I want to be more rigorous. So a few things to pay attention to, right? Uh, it's a partial pressure. It's actually a property of a substance in a condensed phase. Even though it has the word vapor in it, it's actually not a property of the vapor phase. It's a property of the condensed phase. It's just expressed as the partial pressure it establishes in, a con in the vapor phase. So why is this essentially the same as what we derived as the pressure phase boundary in our phase diagram? So let's say this is my uh, phase diagram for my substance. So if I take this substance and I put it at some temperature T, right? let me call that T star. So I put this in some closed vessel, this substance, and I put the whole thing at T star. So this is the condensed phase, right? So solid or liquid. And I evacuate the system. So I start with P equals zero. Then the question is, is this system in equilibrium? Well, this phase I'm telling you it's not, right? Because this phase I'm telling you, if I'm at zero pressure and at this temperature, I don't really want to be condensed. I want to be a vapor phase. So what does the thing do? It evaporates stuff to raise the pressure in the vapor phase, right? So it keeps on going up until it hits this point. And when it hits that point, that's when you have equilibrium. So this pressure that we state is the phase boundary between the condensed phase and the vapor, this is actually also the vapor pressure it will establish. Because when I get P star above the condensed phase, my system is in equilibrium. Any questions about that? Now, in practice, we don't use vapor pressure like this. We use vapor pressure in a slightly modified scenario. We have some condensed phase, and above here, we have a pressure of one atmosphere. Right? We have oxygen, nitrogen, all this other stuff present. So the, the real question to ask, if I apply T star here, right, I will get a vapor pressure P star. And let me call that P star prime. And the question is, is P star prime equal to P star? Does everybody understand the, the question? So the question is, I, this is a well-defined case, right? I have only the substance present, single component, in both the vapor and the condensed phase. Here, I'm in a different scenario. I have only the pure substance, the pure substance here. But above it is a higher pressure than the vapor pressure. Because here I have one atmosphere, and let's say our vapor pressure is below one atmosphere. So here I have a higher pressure. So is P star prime the same as P star? So this is worked out um, in several notes. Uh, one place where you can find the derivation is in Ragon section 4.7. But, so I'm not going to do the derivation, but I'm going to help you think through it. So let's think through this, right? 
we have equilibrium between these two, between the vapor, the, the species in the vapor and the species in the condensed phase when their free energies are the same. So I could say that here, G of the substance in, can I, uh, let me call it the condensed phase, the liquids, just so we have a simple argument. So G in the liquid at P star is equal to G in the vapor at P star, right? That's the definition of this phase boundary. So when I go to, let me call this situation A and this situation B, when I go to situation B, what happens to the free energy of the liquid? Does it stay the same? Does it go up? Does it go down? Sorry, sometimes the camera doesn't focus very much. I feel like I have to walk around and stand still. Come on, focus, focus. There we go. What happens to the vape, to the free energy of the liquid? It's modified, right? Because there is a higher pressure here that applies to the liquid. So what am I gonna get here? What is G? liquid in scenario B, right? I don't know, too many indices by now. G liquid in scenario B is going to be something like G liquid at P star, right? I said I wasn't gonna do this and I'm doing it anyway. And plus what? Plus the effect from the pressure, which is going to be something like V of the liquid times the pressure differential, right? Because V is the derivative of G with respect to P. So that means the free energy of my liquid state, my condensed state is going up. So something has to happen to the free energy of my vapor as well. So it also has to go up. So the vapor pressure here is going to be modified. But if you do the actual derivation, you, what I want you to do is actually calculate by how much, because this term here is actually quite small, right? We're only going to, this delta P is no larger than one atmosphere because it's essentially going from P star, which we assume to be below one, one atmosphere to one atmosphere. So it's of the order of one atmosphere and V is small. So this shift in G is very small. So what that means that in practice, unless we work in strange conditions where the applied environment is extremely high pressure, what you read off from this diagram is actually the vapor pressure in realistic conditions as well. It's also the vapor pressure when other species are present in the vapor. Um, and what that means is that, that the clausius clapeyron equation that we've developed here is really practical because this is actually an equation for the vapor pressure in practical conditions, which is really what we want, right? Because we want to be able to calculate when we work with chemicals, with materials, we want to be able to calculate the vapor pressure. When we deal with mass transport problems, when we deal with hazard issues, you want to know what the vapor pressure. And so the clausius clapeyron equation will tell you what the vapor pressure of materials is for all practical purposes. So one vapor pressure that we care about a lot in, in uh, our daily lives, if I can quote uh, Sir Thompson, is the vapor pressure of water. So it's always good to keep a few numbers in mind. Uh, the vapor pressure of water Uh, at 25 degrees Celsius, so close to room temperature conditions, the vapor pressure is about 3%, so the vapor pressure is about 0 0.003 bar. So about 3%. Um, 
So if you put if you put water at room temperature, it will develop uh, about zero 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 three bar or atmosphere, roughly the same, right, of water in the vapor. So roughly three percent of your air will be water. Uh, if you go to forty Celsius, that actually starts to go up quite dramatically. At 40 Celsius, um, P star is 0 0.07 bar. So 7% of your air is already water. And of course, we know this, right? War warmer air can take up a lot more water. This is why you blow dry your hair or why you do whatever with hot air, right? Um, the way humans experience um, humidity, though, You know, when I used to teach on the East Coast, this went much better over. If you've ever experienced uh, East Coast humidity, it's a part of your life, uh, unlike in California. But um, relative humidity, so RH stands for uh, not restoration hardware, but relative humidity, um, is the actual partial pressure of water in the air divided by the saturation pressure, so the vapor, the, um, vapor pressure. So this is the actual, and this is the vapor pressure. So the saturation, the maximum you can get into. So if I have at room temperature 3% uh, water, 0 .00, 0 0.03 bar, I'm at 100% relative humidity. But if I heat that air up to 40 Celsius, I'm only at about, what is that, 40? 40 something percent humidity. And the reason that this is what you experience is because what you tend to experience is the ability of your body to cool by uh, perspiration, right? Because uh, evaporation of water from your skin is a major way to cool your skin. So if you are in an environment with 100% relative humidity, you have no ability to cool by um, evaporation. And that's why this is such an important measure uh, rather than the uh, absolute humidity. Um, vapor pressure uh, uh, is actually a quite effective way um, for mass transport or sort of invisible mass transport and um, the best example that I've ever seen is um, if you make ice cubes in the freezer and you leave them there, if you put an ice cube if you put an ice cube in the middle of a freezer, what happens to it? Especially if you made it yourself, like if you made it yourself from tap water, um, like in those tray things, right, that come with your freezer or your refrigerator. Okay, help me out here. What happens to it? It, it disappears, right? Sorry, you were going to answer. Why? Okay, you tell me why it disappears. Oh, I was just going to tell you that it disappears. I was oh, going to okay. tell you why. <laughs> Take a stab at it. Why does it disappear? And it becomes yucky, right? Is it the, the, the vapor pressure in the freezer is too low and it equilibrates? Yeah, basically because how does a freezer work, right? Uh, you know, a freezer does cooling from the outside, right? So you do heat extraction, right, on the outside. There's cooling elements, which means that at most times there is a small temperature gradient. So like call this T center and T surface. And at most times T center is larger than T surface because you need that gradient to transport heat out. So what happens, that means that here in the center, you set up a vapor pressure of water And because the temperature is higher, the vapor pressure of water here is larger than the vapor pressure of water there. So what happens constantly, 
constantly but slowly, you know, water leaves here as vapor and it condenses here back on the surface. So your ice cube basically disappears by vapor transport. And this may be not something you'd expect, right? Because when you have a thermal gradient, you will, over the long term, have mass transport in it, simply because of uh, vapor issues. So your, your um, ice cube ends up on the surface of your fridge, right? And unless you have a cell defrosting fridge, after a while, you have a mess. And of course, the ice cube gets very messy and really not, you know, like you really don't want to make your cocktail drink with it because what it leaves behind is minerals, right? So all the water goes in the vapor pressure, the minerals don't go in the vapor pressure. So the ice cube looks uh, really yucky and you really don't want to give it to your friends who come over. Although none of us has any friends who come over these days, so. Okay. As good engineers, you can use this to your advantage, right? See, good engineers always take something that looks bad and then you make it into something useful. Um, you know, you can actually use this to get rid of stuff, right? If I make cold surfaces, I can deposit stuff on them because the vapor pressure there will be really low. So this is the basic operating principle of things like cold fingers in microscopes, right? If you have a, a TM column, a microscope, or anything where you like, you know, want to have like a, a good vacuum, you, you know, you stick like, um, uh, you know, you run liquid nitrogen or whatever, you stick a cold finger in there. And, you know, obviously you pump vacuum right in a column, but also if you make something really cold, you can make crap deposit on it, right? Because it'll, it'll come out of the vapor. And this is especially effective for, you know, water, for any organics that might evaporate in your column. Uh, stuff that comes off your sample. So, so this is the engineering version of the uh, bad ice cube. I'm going so slow compared to last year. I don't know what to say about that. Like, you know, the, the fact I don't know how this works. You would think the opposite, right? The fact that there is less interaction with the students, you would think makes me go, would, would you think would make me go faster, but I don't know. I don't have a theory for this. Maybe, maybe stimulation of the students in a real classroom makes me go much faster because I'm so excited about the material. So maybe, maybe that's the theory. You know, if you don't have uh, any good theory, you can make up anything, right? Let's call it kinetics. Kinetics can explain everything. Okay, so it also means that um, when you have saturated vapors, you get weird heat capacities, right? So let's think of what happens when I wanna change um, the temperature of a saturated system. Okay, I should go back to black. You can see black more easily. Okay, so let's say you have um, a system, like let's say it's air with 100% humidity. So fully saturated with water. And I try to give it a DT. If this DT I want to give it is negative, then what, has, what happens, right? So what happens is that when I go down in temperature, I don't just cool the air. I also have to condense a certain amount of water because at the lower temperature, so this is water, liquid, at the lower temperature, my vapor pressure is lower. So I cannot retain the same vapor pressure. So when I look now at the delta H that has to come out, right? or the delta Q that has to come out, it's what I would call the normal one. So delta Q, like of the air system, right? This is what you would normally calculate from CP, DT, and blah, 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 right? But it's also plus the heat of condensation.
because I'm, I have to condense a certain amount of water out of the vapor. So this number is going, this is going to be larger than the normal heat capacity of air. So all I'm trying to tell you is that saturated systems have higher heat capacity because in some sense they are reactive systems, right? They are sort of like, you know, they are hitting you with Le Chatelier's principle, right? You know, what is Le Chatelier's principle in the end, right? You try to do something, the system works against you, right? So whenever a system has internal degrees of freedom, it will always work against you. That's essentially Le Chatelier's principle, right? And that's what's happening here, right? There's an internal degree of freedom here. The air can condense. So I wanna change the temperature. The system responds with taking on a higher heat capacity. So I, I need to extract even more heat than I thought to, um, um, to lower the temperature. There have been many good homework problems written like that. I, I think we preserved a few uh, in, in, in the problem set. Um, there are many practical consequences to that, right? So um, for example, this is one reason that humid climates tend to have warmer nights. Uh, the biggest reason, of course, is that they have clouds, which keep the, the warmth in, but also the air already has a much higher heat capacity, effective heat capacity than, um, than dry climates. That's why you always need a sweater in California. When you go out eating, oh, nobody goes out eating anymore, right? Either. Okay, so for the last 30 minutes, what I want to do is something that I kind of invented myself, so I'm very proud of it, um, which is the generalized Clapeyron equation. Well, I didn't really invent it, but it's not found in most books. I was inspired by other things, so it's invention by inspiration. And, you know, the Clapeyron equation, for some reason, is in every thermal textbook, is always in the same chapter, and the title of the chapter is always one component systems. Um, and, and what I want to show you is that the Clapeyron equation is much more useful than that. It, it really, you can apply it kind of usefully in any system. So I want to do it for a system with any set of word variables, right? So we're going to now go to any set of word variables. So just to refresh you, just in time for the midterm next week, you can write out what the internal energy is, right? Some i, y i, the x i. And you know, normally you work on the control of the intensive variable. So you would Legendre transform, blah, blah, blah. So you would invent some G-like object, right? After a while, I call everything G, right? And so DG, by now you can do this very fast, right? I'm gonna skip a bunch of steps. DG would be minus SDT plus VDP. Wait, 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 no, no, no VDP. I'm doing this in general. So minus some I XI dy I. That would be the differential of the Jean transform. So, I can now make a Clausius-Clapeyron relation between any two pairs of intensive variable changes. So I can make a Clausius-Clapeyron equation for any situation where I vary only two intensive variables. So where all variables are constant except two. I should say intensive. So, so let's say I, I, I always will work with T so because we care about how things change with temperature. So I'm always gonna assume that I can do temperature variations and then I'll just assume that there's some um, yj that I can change. So some intensive variable uh, that's general. 
So I'll leave it to you to prove the clausius clapeyron equation, right? But you're going to do it in the same way as I did in the beginning of this lecture. You're going to require that the dg for both phases, so let's call them alpha and beta, is the same along the boundary. So that the free energy remains constant and the delta g between them remains zero. So how would the clausius clapeyron equation look like? The variation of dy, uh, why don't I call it j, dt, at the boundary, I mean, you can write this out by now, right? I mean, you know how this works, right? This would be, again, forget about the sign, right? This would be plus or minus the conjugate of this here, right? Delta S. And what would I have here? Right, this would, how does dy operate on the free energy difference? Well, that's through delta xy, right? The difference, delta xj, the difference in the xj extensive property. And if you did it right, it would be with a minus sign. So this is the general Clapeyron equation. And again, you know, if you have trouble remembering this, this is really a balance of thermodynamic forces, right? If I rewrite it, what I'm really saying here is that delta xj, the difference in the xj property across the boundary times the yj has to equal to delta s times dt. Well, with a minus sign because of the way they're defined. So I'm saying that the thermal variation on the free energy has to be compensated by some work variation, some mechanical variation or electrical one, right? So that's why the clausius clapeyron equation uh, looks like that. So let's put that to action. If I, I may make it through three examples. We have 27 minutes. Okay, first one. I want to do is a binary phase diagram. And I, I think most of you have seen binary phase diagrams in your undergraduate. But if you haven't, I don't know. You can read your email now. So when I draw a binary phase diagram, let's say like a eutectic, you normally draw it like this, right? Got this thing. So I don't know, let's call this alpha, beta. Let's say we have a liquid. So here you have alpha plus beta, alpha plus liquid, liquid plus beta. Um, and again, these are two phase regions, right? These are regions of discontinuity. So this is T and here I plot XB, the concentration of B. So, this is a diagram plotted in one intensive variables and one extensive variables, right? So remember that concentration may look intensive to you, but it's not, right? It's a normalized extensive variable because it comes from the amount of B and we just normalized it. So it's what's called, what we call uh, a density. And it's because you plot against an extensive variable that you see a discontinuity. So just like in a one component, this, phase and we had a volume discontinuity across the boundary, here we have a composition discontinuity in going say from alpha to beta. So what I want to sort of figure out is how would this diagram look like if I plot in a pure intensive space? So T and something that's intensive here and of course as you know the, the intensive conjugate to stuff that has to do with amount like concentration is going to be some kind of form of chemical potential. So I want to roughly show you how that looks like and how the, class is, uh, how the Clapeyron equation would look like. So uh, again, I'm going to do this in, in limited form and let you uh, fill in the details. But if you can, please let us know, right? So um, how would you do this formally? Formally, but abbreviated. So if you write, again, you're going to get so good that you can just plot, swap this on paper. but I'm going to write it out completely for now. So the internal energy would have the normal, you know, 
uh, TDS and PDV and all that kind of stuff in it, right? But uh, now, because you can change the composition, so you can actually change, uh, take material in and out of the system, in principle, there is a term mu b, the n b, and a term mu a, the n a, right, in the internal energy, because we have mass transfer. We're not quite doing that. We're doing a concentration change. So we're swapping A for B. So I can impose the constraint that the NB is equal to minus the NA. So I'm just swapping because I'm normalizing the system. I'm swapping uh, A for B, which means that if I plug that in, the actual term that will appear, so there will be dot, 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 mu B minus mu A, times d and b, right? And if you remember, like remember when I asked you to do this derivation of coupled extensive flows, how you get equilibrium with a coupled extensive flows, that's exactly what I'm doing here, right? I'm coupling the extensive flow of b and a because I'm allowing as perturbation only a concentration change. Uh, then the effective intensive variable is some kind of linear combination of the conjugates, right? So what appears here is mu b minus mu a. Um, I hope that this sort of brings back some of the earlier material uh, in the class for you. Um, just so I don't have to write this all the time, I'm just going to call this mu b star. Uh, so I don't always have to write mu b minus mu a. So uh, if I wanna work now under control of the chemical potential, mu b star, instead of concentration, I would do some kind of Legendre transform, right? So I would do some kind of uh, Legendre transform, which would be, again, phi would be minus T, u minus ts plus pv. But if I wanna control mu instead of the amount of b, I would also have some Legendre transform that's now uh, minus uh, mu b star, uh, NB, right? And then I would take the differential of this and blah, 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 blah. Um, my blah, blah, blah is to encourage you to do this actually in full. So unless you, if you can actually exactly guess what I'm gonna write next, then you're done. So if you can kind of tell me without deriving how this differential is gonna look like, you are golden. So this is gonna look like, this is gonna be minus SDT, right? Plus VDP. And then what am I going to get here? I'm going to get something like minus NB D mu B star. Time to take a breather. So how will my Clapeyron equation look like? So uh, let's say I wanna do this boundary or any of these two phase boundaries, right? So at that boundary, this potential has to remain the same, right? The value of this potential for alpha and beta has to remain constant. Well, the difference I would say between, so at the boundary, delta phi, which is, I'll say defined as phi beta minus phi alpha, has to be zero. That's the definition of the boundary. So if I follow exactly the derivation of the Clapeyron equation, I'm gonna get that dt d mu b, mu b star, is gonna be what? I mean, you can write this, right? What do I get in my Clapeyron equation? I get the conjugate of this, so the chemical potential is causing a free energy change through the fact that the amount of B in both phases is not the same. And the temperature is causing a free energy change because the entropy in the phases is not the same. So my Clapeyron equation has to look like this. I think if I slowly erase here, I can keep the camera on that, yeah should design a robot to erase. No, come on, stay, stay. So 
how does this phase diagram look like in conjugate space? So I want to show it in T mu b star space. Okay, let's look at this transition. Let's say we go from alpha to liquid. If I go from alpha to liquid, delta nb is positive, right? Because the liquid has a higher amount of b and the liquid has a higher entropy. So this is positive too. So this slope, because there's a minus sign here, is negative. So this first boundary, so here I have alpha, here I have liquid, looks like that. I can do the second one, right? Now I go from liquid to beta, right? So delta NB is still positive, and delta, but delta S now is negative because I go from liquid to the solid. So that means that somewhere here, I have a boundary from liquid to beta. And I go from alpha to beta, and of course, delta NB is positive, but delta S I don't know, because I go from one solid to the other. So it's probably small. So this is some finite number, delta NB, but delta S is small, so this slope's gonna be very positive. So basically, this looks like something like that, right? So, haha, I mean, a eutectic phase diagram looks just like a one component system in an intensive variable space, right? This. If I drew this, you could think it's water or some other substance. So this diagram is exactly equivalent to the eutectic. And you can actually calculate the phase boundaries in this binary phase diagram by using the Clapeyron equation. Personally, I think that is immensely cool. But you don't have to agree with me. I know it's early in the morning. Okay, so two more examples. Well, maybe one. You know, your favorite, what is your favorite extra work term? Of course, it's magnetism. Everybody loves magnetism. Everybody just hates the units. So, is it possible to create phase transitions by magnetism? So, magnetically induced transitions. Right, so now we have magnetic work. The question is, can I shift phase transitions? So imagine you read a research paper. Somebody has unexplainable results, but one material is magnetic and phase transitions don't show up where they want to be, so they'll say it must be magnetism. You, having taken thermo at Berkeley, are going to verify this, whether this is actually a plausible statement. So what do you do? Well, you uh, do this very logically, right? So you think of uh, how you're gonna write down the terms in the free energy. Let's forget PDV for a second. There's way too much to write. We, we just established that volume doesn't do much. So this is the magnetic work term. Again, I'm gonna dump mu naught into H. And so you would go to some potential Right, you would control H, so you want to do Legendre transform with respect to T and H. So you would do some Legendre transform, and that would give you a, a D phi, which is minus SDT minus MDH, right? And so what would your Clapeyron equation look like? It would be that DT along a phase boundary the H is equal to minus the difference in magnetization between the phases over the entropy difference. And again, this makes a lot of sense, right? Along a phase boundary, I have to balance the shift in thermodynamic potential coming from temperature, that's dt delta s, with the shift coming from the magnetic field, which is the H times delta m. So can we establish sort of how big this is, right? And this is where it gets very messy. You gotta get exactly the right units here. 
And for magnetism, these units are a complete mess, right? So I'm going to take an example where I go from, say, a ferromagnetic to a paramagnetic material so that I have a maximum delta S. So let's say I go from a ferromagnet to a paramagnet. So a ferromagnet has magnetization. The paramagnet has no magnetization or very small in the magnetic field. So I want to estimate what delta M is. And I don't know, I can't figure out all the units of Gauss and like, all these things and so I went to atomic units which I find much easier in this case so I'm gonna do uh, all this per atom so I'm gonna do what's the value of a, a magnetic moment per atom so that's usually measured in Bohr magnetons and Bohr magneton is essentially what belongs to a spin right that's a Bohr magneton that's the magnetic moment belonging to a spin so I took something like for the delta magnetization, you know, if you work in an oxide, you have sort of order a few of these spins. So say four Bohr magneton. Turns out it's not going to matter. You can take seven, you can take one, uh, but that's actually the magnetic moment of manganese three plus, which I want to show you an example of later. Um, the key issue is that if you, that you have to put this in the right units, um, which, by Googling it, no, not, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm joking. This is about 10 to the minus fifth electron volt per Tesla. So then we have to figure out what delta S is. Again, now we're sort of doing it per atom. So delta S and here, um, you know, delta S, as you know, right, entropies are of the order of R if you do them per mole, the gas constant. Uh, and if you divide the gas constant R by Avogadro's number, now you come per atom. So that's the Boltzmann constant. So delta S is of the order of the Boltzmann constant. Um, and because this is a spin that can be up or down, there's two choices. Um, I'll add log two to be more exact. If you don't understand where that comes from, we'll do this in STATMEC. And as you're gonna see, it doesn't matter. So if I put that in, I get that dt, dh, I'll put in some numbers here, is uh, minus four times 10 to the minus fifth electron volt per Tesla. And I have to have to, I have to get the Boltzmann constant in electron volts. So that's about 10 to the minus five, right? It's 8.617 times 10 to the minus five uh, electron volt per Kelvin. And I could multiply by log two if I want to, but again, that's a or number of the order of one, which doesn't really matter. But if I were to do, I would find that it's about 0.66 Kelvin per Tesla. Um, and I don't know how much you know about magnetic units, but a Tesla is a huge applied field, right? Um, it's, you know, Tesla, uh, apply, making a magnet that does one Tesla is a big deal. Doing several Tesla is an enormous deal. You go to the magnet lab for that. So magnetic fields in our normal world are even well below a Tesla. But what you see that even for a giant magnetic field, you get only a small shift in temperature. Even though we've gone here from something that's like about as magnetized as you can, I've done several electrons per relevant ion that are participating in the magnetic moment. I took four, right? So this number could be two, four, five, seven. It's never 500 Bohr magneton. Um, and even with those conditions, I get a pretty small shift in temperature for a giant magnetic field. So most of the time, uh, magnetism doesn't really do anything to your thermodynamics, like zilch. So my, my experience in, is that uh, lots of people wanna explain things that they don't understand by weird shifts that they don't understand. And you know, uh, stress is the most popular one. When somebody doesn't understand, they, they first blame kinetics. Uh, then they build, then they blame stress. 
And, and, and if those don't work, they probably blame magnetism or electric fields or something like that. But thermodynamics allows you to make a quantitative assessment of these things. And so far, what you should have learned is that mechanical forces are weak compared to chemical forces. And now we see that magnetic forces are even weaker. And you should have known this, right? If you, if you remember things like from your freshman courses of Zeeman splitting and zeeman riemann splitting of how electron levels split with magnetic field, it's tiny, right? And it's because of this unit crap, right? Again, uh, a magnetic field in electron volts is tiny. It's eventually 10 to the minus five, right? Whereas again, chemical bonding is order several electron volts. That doesn't mean that there are not cases where this is important. Um, so I want to, let me quickly share something. I think we have time. Let me show you a phase diagram. Um, I hope you joined the lecture early. So, um, you could enjoy the theme song for today, those of you who joined early. And it really should have been the theme song for last lecture, which was uh, Diamonds by Rihanna. Come on, okay. Okay, here's a very like messy uh, diagram, sorry about that. Uh, it's probably been Xeroxed way too many times. Um, so this is the phase diagram of uh, a really famous uh, perovskite structure. It's um, uh, lanthanum calcium, it's lanthanum calcium uh, uh, magnesium oxide. And um, so you're familiar with perovskites, right? Perovskites are A, B, O, three, where A is the big cation and B is the six volt coordinated uh, smaller cation. So here B is manganese um, and A, is the mixture of lanthanum calcium. And the reason you wanna mix lanthanum and calcium is because you're changing the valence on manganese, right? So lanthanum is three plus, right? Lanthanum is three plus, calcium is two plus. So if I change the ratio of lanthanum to calcium, I'm changing the valence of manganese. I'm essentially switching between manganese three plus and manganese four plus. If I have all calcium, I would have manganese four plus for charge compensation. If I have all lanthanum, I would have manganese three plus. And manganese three and four plus have um, a different magnetic moment, but more importantly, they have quite different uh, magnetic interaction between each other. So when you make this phase diagram as a function of calcium, okay, pen is going every time. Right, here's the, what you get is that, so uh, in some regimes, this is uh, a metal. So the conductivity is high. It's a ferromagnetic metal uh, when you go, uh, to other conditions, an antiferromagnetic insulator. Come on. Uh, and then at high temperature, it becomes a paramagnetic insulator. Now, so if you put yourself very close to this boundary, right? Here you have a large magnetic moment, the metal. In the insulator, the paramagnetic insulator, uh, you have a small magnetic moment. So if you put yourself here, with a large enough magnetic field, you can actually kind of go back and forth across this transition. And what does that do? That does something very cool and you can get a Nobel Prize for it. And this is the simple version of explaining it. The reason is that paramagnets and ferromagnets uh, with localized electrons have very different conductivity because of the Pauli exclusion principle. So if you have a ferromagnet, Right, so this is the magnetic moment on one atom and this is the one on the other end versus let's say you have an anti magnet or in the paramagnetic case, this is just disordered. But so this is ferro. This is anti right? So if you are a, an electron, a slightly free electron to make conductivity, okay, you can't see pink, right? but electrons are somewhat delocalized, so they're not hard to see, so I'm gonna keep pink, okay? So, okay, you're an electron here. You're very happy here because you satisfy Hund's rule, right? Remember Hund's rule? Hund's rule says that, you know, as much as possible, you wanna have electrons with the same spin when they're localized. So if you jump, you're just as happy here because the spins are ferromagnetic, right? So 
the electron jumps with spin polarization. So it's happy here, it's happy here. If you do that in an antiferromagnet, what happens? Very happy, right? Electrons very happy. The electron now jumps. Electron transfer is with spin conservation. Now electron is very unhappy, right? Because here it doesn't satisfy Hund's rule. So this is why ferromagnets in localized system in oxides have better conductivity than antiferromagnets, right? Because in a ferromagnetic, you can, you can jump with um, spin preservation. In antiferromagnets, you can't. And that's why in that phase diagram, there's, there's a reason that the antiferromagnet is the metal and the antiferromagnet is the insulator. It's actually their magnetic state that's controlling their uh, conductivity. Okay, now come the finale. What happens when you use a magnetic field to shift around here? Like to toggle this transition on and off. And even though I've shown you that this is a small shift in temperature, what you can actually do in materials, you can sort of enlarge this by being very close to transition where you can make uh, the entropy change very small. So if I make this very small, right, then the TDH is gonna become actually quite large. Uh, so if you put yourself near a second order transition, which is what this is, then this delta S at the transition, you know, has to go to zero. Um, let me actually unshare so you can see me better. So if I put myself near a second order transition, right, remember second order transition, no um, discontinuity in the first derivatives. So this goes to zero, right? Now this kind of has to go to zero too. So I'm messing around here a bit, right? Because you have to use L'Hopital's rule, right? Because you're gonna get zero over zero. Um, but you can make this large, believe me. So what happens when you measure the conductivity? You get a giant change in electrical conductivity because you're sort of constantly switching from a ferromagnetic state to an antiferromagnetic or a paramagnetic state. So you see enormous uh, conductivity changes. And this is one form of what's called giant magnetoresistance, right? So magnetoresistance is essentially uh, the, the switching of uh, electrical conductivity with a magnetic field. And it's intrinsically coupled to something like the phase behavior. In, in thin films, it's a little more complicated and so. Um, but you can sort of see now why, right? And, and if it were a pure phase transformation, you could actually calculate it with uh, Clausius Clapeyron. Um, I wanted to do one more uh, on thermoelasticity, which is kind of cool. Um, it's essentially switching um, phases, uh, single crystals by stress, uh, which under the right conditions you can do. Uh, maybe I'll just sort of tape this or write this up and send it to you. Uh, shortly so that we can sort of finish this because this was the last part of, uh, of what we were going to cover. Um, cool, any questions? So then we're kind of done with classical thermal. Um, like I said before, we've done everything you need to know in setting up the structure of classical thermodynamics, except I didn't do stability theory but you can kind of get away without that. Um, so in the class, that means there only remains us to do two things. Um, one is that after the exam, we'll sort of take a breather from classical thermal and, and we will go into statistical mechanics. And the reason for that is that um, statistical mechanics will show you the underpinnings of some of these equations. But more importantly, because statistical mechanics connects you to the microscopic world, it will allow you to get numbers, right? It will allow you to build models for materials and, and, and get to numbers like heat capacities and internal energies and entropies and so. Um, and after we do that, we come back and we kind of apply it all together. So the third part of the course, as I mentioned in the beginning, is you put this all together and can we now make statements about real materials, about mixed, mostly mixtures of materials and how they behave. But to be honest, you know, you may have thought of thermodynamics as a complicated subject, and maybe you still think that, but this is it, right? We covered this, it's all like what, it's September something. Um, and you know, we did like what, five weeks of lectures or something like that. This is all of thermodynamics pretty much, right? This is understanding how to put in work terms, 
right? You know, how does your system interact with the environment? Understanding how to set up the equilibrium conditions for when you are under the conditions of those work terms. And then understanding how to sort of manipulate these differentials and stuff like that, right? In some sense, the classic Laperon is already an, an, an application. That is really all there is to thermodynamics, right? Just so you get it. Everything else is model building. So ideal gas is not a part of thermodynamics, right? It's a model of a material, right? When later we'll do ideal solution and regular solution, those are not part of the formal structure of thermodynamics. These are just models we build. The, this is the formal structure of thermodynamics. This is all there is to it, right? It's basically just setting up work terms and learning how to handle differentials. Okay, cool. Um, we're still on track to give the exam on Wednesday. I hope you're on track too. Um, we haven't gotten a lot of questions from you, which worries me. And uh, normally, like I uh, wrote in the email, Piazza is a very active communication channel with the students, but maybe you have other ways to communicate. I do hope you're working on the problems because uh, thermodynamics is not a subject you can learn the evening before a midterm. It uh, requires a certain amount of dwell time. Uh, you know, I, I would encourage you to do problems more than once. I hope you did them a while ago and then you can do them, you know, before the exam again, because I always feel like you learn a lot more the second time you do them. Uh, the first time you struggle with the concepts, with uh, the symbols, but the second time is when you really get like what the problem means. So uh, I hope you're making progress on that. Um, the three of us will be available for questions as much as possible. And uh, I owe you the kind of guidelines. I think so those of you who said they don't have a printer, I think we're okay with that. We're gonna make the exam so you don't actually have to write on it. You, you are welcome to if you want to, um, but those of you who are not a printer can just look at the exam on their screen and just write on a piece of paper and, and get that to us. But we're gonna get the whole like manual of how to do this um, You know, if any of you, um, like if you can't start on time because something went wrong, just tell us and you know, we're, we're, you know, we're all trying to be reasonable in this, uh, in this situation, so. Um, I think that's it. I'll be at my office hours today, but I do have a sharp cutoff at two. So if you wanna, uh, if you have questions for me, uh, maybe you wanna show up on time, uh, but we can also be available for uh, questions at other times uh, uh, next week. So have uh, enjoyed the rest of your day. See you later. <laughs>